How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to another episode where we're going to turn the Supra into a time attack car. So I'm back, of course, at Deslow Garage, the home of Pink Ribbon Racing, and I've got a table full of parts in front of me. So that can only mean that it is install day. And today we're focusing on brake parts, specifically a big brake kit and why you might want to have a big brake kit or not want to have a big brake kit. Depends on the application. But uh, our newest partner is StopTech Brakes, and uh, they were kind enough to send these brakes over. So I'm going to go over with you what it is that makes this brake kit nice, why you would want to have a big brake kit on your car, and some specifics about these parts, and then we're going to go ahead and install it. Uh, then we're also going to go into a little bit of detail on our splitter, because our splitter is finished and it is currently on the car. Uh, so we'll show that to you. We'll also pull it off and show you some details about it. Um, it's awesome, and I'm super excited to show that to you, but we'll start with brakes. So here's our caliper. First of all, it's really pretty. Um, it's all aluminum. It's super lightweight. Um, and it is a six piston caliper. And as you can see in here, the pistons are not all the same size. So that's something you see sometimes on multi-piston calipers. Um, and this is not something, by the way, that I would determine uh, what size to make the pistons. I'm not nearly smart enough for that. I let StopTech do it for me. But the reason that you might wanna have different size pistons in here is because as that rotor is spinning, the forces that you would want to apply on the different parts of the caliper would not necessarily be exactly the same. So they've figured out that for this particular design and size of caliper and this particular design and size of rotor, uh, having these pistons be that specific size that they are is going to give you the most even force and that helps you have the best amount of bite, the most linear response from the brakes and also makes your pads last longer. Speaking of rotors, here's our rotor. So this is a separate rotor and hat design. So you can see we've got two separate pieces of metal here that are bolted together. You can see the bolts are on this side over here. And there's a couple of advantages to using that style of rotor. One is weight. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you and say that this thing is super lightweight. It can't be, it's giant. It's gonna have some weight to it. But it would be heavier if this was all a one-piece design because this piece in the middle is aluminum. Most normal rotors, these are steel because it's all one big piece of steel. The outer portion pretty much has to be steel unless we're talking about carbon ceramic, but um, so that's gonna be heavy, but this is nice and light. So that just takes some of that overall mass away. The other benefit to having two separate pieces of metal here is that it transfers less of the heat from the brakes into the hub of the car. So this is something I talked about on a way earlier video that's on the same channel, but uh, the less heat you put into that hub, the longer your wheel bearing is going to last. And we're gonna be generating a whole lot of heat with this car. It's relatively heavy. It's gonna have a lot of power. Um, and we're gonna be going real deep and real hard in the braking zone. So anything we can do to keep that heat away from the hub is gonna be good. And this is gonna help us do that. And then we've got these little pieces here. These are the brackets that mount the caliper to the, to the hub of the car. We've got our stainless steel brake lines, naturally. And finally, we've got brake pads. Now, these are the StopTech brake pads that come with the kit. I don't actually even know what they are. They say ST Sport brake pads. I'm assuming these are sort of a dual purpose pad. I'll look them up a little bit later to figure out exactly what they are. And we're probably gonna put them in there and, and try them out, but this isn't necessarily exactly what we're going to want for, for race purposes. So StopTech is really nice about this. They don't say you have to use their pads. We can use whatever pads are gonna work best for our specific need. And that's exactly perfect for what we're doing. So these are gonna be great for certain people, for certain applications, but we're probably going to want something that can do a little bit higher temp. So we're going to play around with pads a little bit and see what we need. And if you remember in our last video, the paint that we put on the rotor, well, we're going to do the same thing on these and we're going to figure out what exact temp range we want our pads to be at. And that's how we'll, we will choose exactly which pads go in the car. Okay, so that's what we've got here, but why? Why do we want a big brake kit on this car or really any car? If you're thinking it's because it makes the car stop faster, you are wrong. Big brakes do not make cars stop any faster 99.9% .9 of the time. Tires are actually what make a car stop faster. So think about it. If you took the ABS fuse out of your car, or if you don't have ABS in the first place, and you slammed on the brakes from 100 miles per hour, would the wheels lock up? If they do, that means brake force is not your limiting factor. So we don't actually need to increase the amount of brake force the car has. The reason they locked up is because there wasn't enough tire grip for the amount of demand you were putting on the brakes. So if these are not for increasing the brake force, what must they be for then? They are for heat management. The larger these components are, the more heat dispersion there is. So think about it. This big old rotor right here has a lot of surface area that's touching the air. Any surface area that touches the air is an opportunity for the heat to radiate out into the environment. Thank you, JJ. Now, as you can see, our new rotor 
It's quite a bit larger than our old rotor. So that's a whole lot more surface area. Let's see. I mean, I'm not a scale, but I'd say that this is a little bit lighter than stock, even though it's larger. And of course, on the caliper, you've got all this air gap in here, all these areas here where you can see more metal, uh, more metal surface touching the air, that's gonna be good for heat dissipation as well. So, larger components, more surface area touching the air, that's how these brakes are going to be effective. Now, you've got the side bonus of if you've got better control over the forces being applied, it might give you a firmer pedal, it might be a little bit more consistent, and that's great, especially when you're driving fast on track and you need to be really precise with your braking, that's really helpful, but the main reason the big brakes are helpful is heat. Now let's talk about why you maybe wouldn't want to do a big brake kit. Well, a wider rotor is going to have more rotational inertia. So it's not a free lunch here. You don't just get benefits. There are always some drawbacks, there's give and take. So generally speaking, you want the rotor to be as large as it needs to be to disperse the amount of heat you've got and no bigger than that. So in fact, once we get this on the car and do some testing, we might realize that we have more metal than we need and we might actually reduce the size of that rotor a little bit. You want it to be just good enough and no more. If this was an endurance car, then yes, we would for sure want as big of a rotor as we can possibly fit under there because we know we're gonna be doing lap after lap after lap. But on a time attack car, you really only need to do one hot lap at a time. So as small as you can get away with, without overheating your components, it's gonna be the hot ticket. So one more reason it's good to go with a company like StopTech uh, rather than trying to piece together your own brake kit is because there's more to this than just putting a larger component on the car. The size of these pistons matters a lot, and also the distance away from the center point, just like that. Both of those two things will change how much force is put on the brakes. Now, from the factory, your car is probably already really close to being perfect in terms of how much brake force it has front versus rear, the brake bias. So if you take those same components and you move it wider away from the hub center, you're giving it more torque. And if you just do that on the front of the car, now you're hurting your brake bias. You're gonna have much more front than you are rear brake bias, and that's gonna make the car actually stop worse than it did before. And then the other component, of course, is the piston size. So the total piston area inside this caliper is what's going to determine how much clamping force this has, and that's in relation to the piston size in the master cylinder. So if the master cylinder is going to stay the same, which for most people, it does stay the same, you don't change that out, and then you increase the size of the piston area here, then you're actually drastically changing the ratio of fluid transfer. And your pedal is going to end up really spongy. It's going to go almost all the way to the floor and you're going to have way too much brake clamping force in the front end compared to what you have in the back. So it's really crucial that you get not only the distance from hub center correct, but also the piston area correct to get your brake bias where it's supposed to be. Otherwise, you're going to install big brakes and think you're helping yourself, but you're actually going to reduce the, the uh, braking performance of your car. So, be careful about this, talk to somebody who knows what they're doing, or just buy a StopTech kit because it's already been figured out for you. All right, so let's go and transition over so we can start actually working on the car. We're gonna install this stuff, but before we do that, I wanna show you some of the stock stuff on the car because it's really not that bad. Um, it's some really good components. It's a four piston caliper. Um, the only reason we're really changing it out is because we wanna have a little bit more heat dissipation capability. So let's compare these parts, let's get them on the car. All right, here are our stock components. Um, and I don't think these were on the car last time we made a video, so. These are really nice. You, uh, if you watch our older videos, you know how I feel about lug bolts. So I'm happy to see these here. But anyway, we're talking about brakes. So let's start with the rotor. So this is actually a pretty good piece already. This is steel, this is aluminum. The difference is these are riveted in place rather than bolted in place. One of the problems with a rotor like this, it's a really freaking expensive. It costs basically the same to get our big brake kit as it would just to replace the stock components on this. So that's another great reason to go with a kit like that StopTech. But this is pretty good for an OEM piece. It's gonna be lighter, it's not gonna put as much heat into the hub, it's veined and the veins are curved, so these are directional. So this is a right side, and the one on the left side is a left side. So that means these only really work best when going straight. Most people are probably not that concerned with how effective their brakes are in reverse at dissipating heat, so that's not so much of a concern. Uh, but the stop techs are also the same. In fact, the veins are even more uh, accentuated in one direction than the OEM piece. Now let's take a look at the caliper. So this is a four piston fixed. So it's a similar design because it's got two pistons here facing that way and two pistons back here facing this way. Stop techs are three and three. These are the same size. You can see that the pad itself is not very wide. So you don't really need to get into that whole different size piston 
stuff on, a, on something like this. Um, it's also more expensive to do it that way. Uh, so a caliper like this is going to put pretty much the same force everywhere on the pad, whereas the new one is going to put different forces, very specific amounts of forces, to even everything out. The size of these pistons are going to be larger than on the stop deck because there's only two, uh, four of them, because there's only four of them versus the six. So the total area of the six is going to be pretty much more or less the same as the total area of these four, and that's going to make the brake force about the same as stock, so we don't lose our front to rear balance. So again, these are pretty good components. I have got no problem with these. They're just not quite big enough. So these are going to go, we're going to put the new ones in, and they're going to be cheaper to service, cheaper to maintain. There's going to be a way better pad availability for trying out different compounds for different temperature ranges, and it's just going to be a nicer overall unit to work with. All right, JJ, what are you doing over here? Uh, I am cleaning the rotor with uh, soap and water and then brake clean. So with brand new rotors, uh, there are certain, uh, certain rotors, especially performance rotors, uh, they have this coating that comes in with the brand new rotor that you have to wash off. In this case, they call it a, it's a rust inhibitor. So if you don't wash it off during break-in period, you're basically, it's basically reducing the performance of the brake rotors immediately off the bat. So there's a couple of preparations you have to do, basically just cleaning it off with brake cleaning and soap and water in the beginning before you install it. So that's what I'm doing. Yeah, just basically using a wire brush, soap and water to scrub off that uh, coating that's on the rotor when it comes brand new. And then when you, so that way it's uh, good to go when you break it in. Not every rotor has it, but in, the, in this case, this has it. Most of the time I just do it just in case. It's time to put these brakes in. I'm going to start with the line here. So the stock line is right here. You can see it's attached to our caliper, which is just tied in place so it doesn't hang by the line. Right here is where the line meets with the hard line. And this goes up to the ABS block, which you can actually see right there. So right here, we're going to disconnect this with line wrenches, and then the line and the caliper will come away. They are filled with fluid, however, so easy, very easy to make a mess. I'll make that JJ's problem <laughs> as quickly as I can. Um, so just really quickly about the line here. So this is stainless steel with a Teflon coating. That's pretty standard for this sort of thing. Uh, these calipers use banjo bolts, which is this piece right here. You can see there's a hole that goes through it. That's what the fluid goes through inside there and then out through the holes. So to try to make this as less, less messy, as least messy, I can English, to try to keep this as clean as possible, I'm using these. And these actually came in the StopTech kit. It's just a little rubber grommet. And I've shoved one inside here, and it's got a hole in the tip, so I was able to shove a bolt in there to take up the slack. So that's in there pretty firm. I'm hoping that that's going to prevent it from leaking out. So when I take the stock line off, it's gonna start making a mess immediately. So I gotta try to get this on there as quickly as possible. And then hopefully that won't go anywhere. And then all I need to put it on is one of these crush washers, which goes on just like that. And then theoretically, it'll go right back on the same way the last one came off. Let's see, is it the same bolt size? It's not, I'm glad I checked. Pause, let me get another wrench for this. I'm back with another wrench. Okay, so now I'm actually ready to do this. So I'm gonna set this down, it's ready to go, it's got its crush washer on it. Normal wrench goes on the bottom. Line wrench goes on the top. Once it's loose, you can use a normal wrench, but I didn't think that far ahead, so I don't have one. Also, let me get some towels. So I just had to check my work there and make sure that that washer is in the correct spot. I'm not actually convinced it is a crush washer. It might just be there to prevent this nut portion from going uh, past that bracket, which makes sense because if it did go past the bracket, you wouldn't be able to get a wrench on it. And it shouldn't need a crush washer because these are fluid lines, so they should be pipe fitting where they're a little bit tapered. So as you start to tighten it down, 
it gets closer and closer into the point where it creates a really firm seal. So that's kind of finger tight. Let's get some wrenches on there and see if it seals. One more thing to consider here is that the, st the steel line has sort of a natural bend to it. So you have to make sure that it ends up going the correct direction. If I put this on like 90 degrees or 180 degrees from where it is now, it would end up just pointing off somewhere it's not supposed to be and then it'd have a difficult time getting back to the caliper. So that's pretty much where I want it to be. Let's finish tightening this down. Let's see, did this work? Nope, okay, let's get that new caliper in here as quick as possible before we uh, run completely out of fluid. JJ, I have a present for you. This is your problem now. Oh, thank you. Congrats. Thank you. Mm-hmm, there you go. Baby, baby's first brake pad. Oh, he's all grown up all of a sudden. <laughs> okay. Yeet. All right, so here's our left caliper. You can see it's labeled. That is very important now because these are different sizes as we talked about. So um, that is left, right? Correct? Yes. Let's go put this one on before we lose all of our fluid. That's why we're also using, you know. Speaker six, wire? Yeah, 16 gauge <laughs> cables to do this. Hey, if it's stupid, but it works, it's not stupid. Perfect. All right, excellent. So now the JJ's made it basically impossible for me to get to the back of the caliper. <laughs> That's where our new line is going, right there. So we need a banjo bolt, and it's going to have, this actually is a crush washer, I promise. One on that side, and then we put it in uh, to the line, and then another one goes on top right there, and then it goes into the caliber from there. All right, it's gonna go in that orientation. There's our second crush washer for the other side. And then this will go, hopefully, on the other side of our 16 gauge speaker wire. When your gloves are covered in brake fluid, they're very slippery, come on. Here we go. All right. All right, so that's snugged up. That's not obviously the orientation that it's going to stay in, but at least that'll stop the leak for now until we can get some more components in here and orient this properly. So that's fluid wise anyway, that's the caliper installed. Next we have to put the rotor in and then those brackets and then the caliper will install onto those brackets. So cut to that. Here's our bracket, this goes on next. Gotta make sure it goes on the right way. It's labeled here, it says rotor side pointing out this way. So that means it's going to install just like that. So that reuses the factory hardware. And then these posts here are what the caliper actually bolts onto. After this is bolted on, then we can put the rotor on, then we bolt the caliper on. All right, so let's tighten those down. Now I'm going to have to loosen this just a little bit and we're going to release the floodgate one more time, but that's why I can rotate it as we turn this around, get the wire off and actually seat it down onto these pins here. Okay, that's enough. All right, so that's where it's gonna sit. So that means the line needs to face right about right about there. So I'll lock that down. Hopefully that will never leak ever, ever again. 
All right, rotor's next. So this can't actually be here yet. I just put it there to figure out where the line goes. This little bolt has to come off, this Allen. That's what holds the rotor in place. And it's gone forever. No. That's what holds the rotor in place because typically these cars don't have these studs here. So you need something on there in order to actually get the rotor to stay in place. But they're actually kind of nice. Even if you have studs, the rotor tends to kind of flop around and this holds it exactly where it's supposed to be. Now we play the game where I can see if I can shove this somewhere without scratching it <laughs> while I get the rotor on. Please stay. So that doesn't need to be tight or anything, it just needs to be snug enough to hold the rotor in place. In fact, the tighter you make that, the more impossible it will be to get your rotor off the next time, since heat tends to weld things together. So now that's on. The caliper can go back in place. It should slide right over the rotor. Perfect. Oh my God, that looks good. <laughs> and finally, we put on the hardware to hold that caliper in place. StopTech's really adamant that these need to be torqued to 30 foot pounds, so um, I'm gonna go ahead and do that and not just uh, stick with Guten tight. No ugga dug is here. I'll actually do it right. This nut is getting performance anxiety. Come on, there we go. Everything is a lot more difficult when you've got just a little layer of uh, brake fluid film on your gloves. So this bolt here goes all the way through the caliper, right up to the other side, and it's, there's not enough room for the thickness of this socket. So I have to use either an open end wrench or I have to take that off. Might as well take it off because it's got to come off anyway. All right, so these bolts here, these Allens, are how you remove this bracket, and this bracket is what holds the brake pads in. So this has to come out anyway to, get, to put the pads in, but conveniently, it's the same bolt that has to come out in order to make room for me to tighten this caliper down. So we'll just go ahead and get this all the way off. All right, so here's the bracket or the girdle that holds the brake pads in. You can see it's sprung here and those springs are going to sit right on top of the top of the pad to make sure that it doesn't rattle around and make a bunch of noise. And it's pretty quick and easy to change these out. Once this is off, you just slide the brake pads out, slide the new pads back in, bolt this back in and you're done. You don't have to really take anything else apart. It's really quick and easy to do with the track. So let me set this aside for just a minute while I finish up taking, tightening down and torquing our caliper. All right, that's 30 foot pounds. And if this went correctly, this should spin freely with no issues. All right, I guess it worked. Uh, let's get some pads in here. All right, here's our pad. Actually, quick update. I thought that we just had the street pads. StopTech actually sent us the race pads too. So these are the SR33, ST Race Friction SR33 pads. So these might even be perfect. We might not, might not even have to change them out. Sounds stupid to say it, but I have a friend, you know who you are, who's put these in wrong many times, so friction surface goes towards the rotor. And it just slides in just like that. And then we take our girdle, put it back on top, compress the spring, and slide the bolts through. And you tighten those down and that's really it. Super fast, super easy to change brake pads. I've had other big brake kits on my other cars and they're a little more finicky than this. I like the girdle design, that's pretty nice. Now we have to do the other side. Cue time lapse. Now that all of our brake components are installed, we have to bleed these things. So being that this is a modern fancy car with a lot of electronics, you can't just bleed it the same way you would an older car. There's a procedure. 
that involves the engine computer or the chassis computer. So this is all the same as what you would expect. You've got the brig reservoir here. So we're gonna fill that up with fluid and obviously we're gonna watch it and make sure that it stays topped up. If you look at the caliper here, you have actually two bleeders, one on this side and one on this side, and you have to make sure you bleed both of them. Otherwise you might get an air pocket on one side and then it would be very lopsided and squishy. Um, so that all works like normal, but you have to do it with a scan tool plugged into the car. So Dennis has a scan tool already ready to go. We tested this out. None of us have actually done it before, but we tested it out earlier. Okay, so that noise right there, that's the ABS block activating. So the reason that you have to do this is because if you don't do that, even if you try to bleed all the fluid through, there's still gonna be old fluid in the ABS block. So this actuates the ABS block to make sure all the fluid that is in there gets through. So we have race fluid through the entire system and not just in the lines. So Dennis, how does this work? <laughs> what do we need to do? So pretty much you have to go in and what it does is it activates the ABS unit. Um, that one was just turning it on. So what you're actually supposed to do is bleed certain ones first. It starts from the driver rear and it goes counterclockwise. So here's what we're putting in here. This is a racing DOT4 fluid. Um, this car probably comes with DOT4 from the factory. Let me see. I don't know where the cap is. Oh, here we go. Let's see. It doesn't say. Let's assume it comes with DOT4 from the factory, but it's probably not gonna be a very high temp DOT4. So just like any other parts, brake fluid is a compromise. If it's able to withstand more temperature, then it's not going to last as long because it's, it's going to absorb more moisture from the air. So a higher temp brake fluid, typically you have to change it out more often, but that's okay, it's a race car, we're gonna be changing it out all the time anyway. So because these brakes are so huge, we probably don't need a crazy high temp fluid. Like this is a great fluid. There are higher temp fluids out there, but we probably don't need them because this is gonna dissipate so much heat. Now, if you remember back on our old stock brake setup, we had a little temp sticker on the side of the caliper here. That's gonna be the best measurement for the amount of temperature that the fluid is seeing. And that's always gonna be a lot cooler than what you're seeing on the rotors. Uh, so as long as that stays below the boiling point of the brake fluid, we should be fine. One more thing to know about brake fluid is that there are two temperatures that you need to, sorry, two boiling points you need to know about, the dry and the wet. Dry is when it's brand new and you can kind of throw that out the door because basically that's never really gonna be the case. It's never gonna be perfect in like a sealed laboratory. The wet number is when the fluid is, has been exposed to the environment. So even when it's in the brake system, there is still air in this bottle. It's still being exposed to fluid. So it is absorbing moisture from the air. So the wet, somewhere between the wet and dry number is where it's actually going to sit, depending on how old or new it is. Uh, but you can't assume it's going to be that perfect, incredible dry boiling point. You have to look more at the wet and say, okay, let's build for this, assume the worst, and then make sure you change the fluid out often enough that you stay within that temp range. And as long as that number is above whatever you're seeing on the side of the caliber, you're probably okay. So we're gonna get working on that procedure. And then let's take a look at our splitter. Here is our first test version of our splitter. And this is made now in the actual material that we wanted. This is our carbon honeycomb. It's uh, 8.4 pounds, it's really light. Um, if you pick up a splitter that's made out of more conventional material, it's just a whole lot heavier. So this is the kind of thing that you'll see in a lot of higher end race cars. Um, it's pretty hollow. There's a whole bunch of air inside. So all the mounting points underneath, they actually engineered in these firmer, more dense areas so that the bolts can go there and actually have something to clamp to. So that's pretty cool. There's just enough material and no more. We've got this piece here, which is uh, an aftermarket lip, and that's just to get a little bit more height out of it, to get it lower down. Um, and then we've got this piece, which is just temporary. This is just a, a, an aluminum little sheet that we put there to take up the gap. That's what we would call an air dam. So we're actually gonna 3D print a part that's going to take this gap up perfectly and look a lot nicer and a lot more flush. You can ignore these white lines. That was just for measurements. It's not gonna look like that in the final revision. And then we've also got these pieces here, which uh, type six 3D printed specifically for this application. So you can see it's actually three dimensional there. Um, so it's going to have slightly less drag, I suppose. But the final revision with this whole thing will be 3D printed all the way through here and all the way down there to seal this up entirely. And then when we get further and further into this, we're gonna actually make the splitter a little bit larger. 
So this is going to be wider out this way. We can go up to five inches for our rule set from the furthest point out on the OE body right there. So obviously we got some room. Keep in mind though that it's not five inches out from this lip. It's five inches out from the stock body looking straight down. So this right now, even though it only looks like two and a half, three inches, that's actually five inches from the body of the car. So that's as big as we can go. And then underneath it's going to extend all the way to meet up with the factory under tray pieces. So the rule set says we can only go to the center line of the front wheels, but we didn't even have to go that far because we're meeting up with the factory pieces. So it's bigger than that and within the rules. So that's pretty cool. So these are actually going to be available for sale at some point once we get the final revisions done. So look for those soon. Um, it's going to be, in my personal opinion, the nicest splitter on the market for this car. So check those out soon. That's what we got on the front of this car now. We've got a diffuser too, but we'll talk about that one later. And then of course we're going to have a wing as well. So pretty big aero package going on in this thing. It's going to be awesome. It's going to look awesome. And that's going to give us a ton of high speed grip as well. All right, that is it for today's video. Next time we're going to be covering the wing, the diffuser, and the exhaust. We've already got the downpipe in with no cat. We're going to do the rest of it all the way out the back. Uh, the muffler we're putting on actually has a valve in it. So we can go from super loud for the track, quiet for the street. If you're liking these videos, make sure you subscribe to Supermark 5, hit the bell, get notifications. Um, follow me on Instagram, at Nick Romano Racing, follow Pink Ribbon Racing, Deslow Garage, Intertech Motorsports, Stop Tag Brakes. We'll have a list. <laughs> we'll have a list in the description below. So follow all those, keep up on what we're doing with this car. And geez, there's only like a couple weeks before we're supposed to be competing at Button Willow. So uh, we'll definitely be vlogging that process. So you can follow with us and uh, follow us on Instagram. And we'll see you in the next video. Thank you.